Autonomous weapon systems are likely to become a mainstay of modern advanced militaries. These systems come in different forms, shapes, and sizes, and imbued with different levels of autonomy, and thus have different capabilities in the field. There are numerous reasons for the rise of autonomous weapon systems in contemporary militaries. Aside from their use reducing the number of humans on the battlefield and thus reducing human casualties, such systems can feasibly be capable of waging war more ethically given their potential speed, efficacy, and precision. However, despite these advantages, there remain objections to autonomous weapon systems and their potential deployment. In particular, there is heavy opposition to autonomous weapon systems which are capable of lethal engagement, with organizations advocating for either partial or full bans on the development and deployment of such systems. The arguments against autonomous weapon systems range from principled objections concerning their deleterious effects on human dignity, to more practical concerns about command and control over systems with opaque machine learning algorithms or targeting. In this paper, we avoid these arguments and instead explore how existing law might impact on autonomous weapon systems. In particular, we examine the notion of ors du combat status as it is defined in the Geneva Conventions, arguing that advances in autonomous weapon systems will necessitate a more nuanced approach to determining the status for enemy combatants. Our aim is to show that the law demands a contextualized appraisal of whether or not an enemy is in fact hors de combat, or out of combat, and that, based on this appraisal, more combatants will be deemed hors de combat than is usually taken to be the case. These factors imply that autonomous weapon systems will need to be capable of making finer grained distinctions of hors de combat status of enemies based on subtle contextual factors. In making this final point, we also pay heed to the fact that there are many different types of autonomous weapon systems, and that the determination of hors de combat status may vary depending on the particular autonomous weapon systems under examination. More specifically, an important implication of whether or not an enemy is to be deemed hors de combat is likely to depend upon very specific contextual factors in a given case. To see this, let's consider a couple of examples. First, imagine a fully autonomous Reaper drone designated to neutralize an insurgent leader, a case we will call high value target. The commander of a forward operating base alongside his tacticians, legal professionals, and other experts determines that the most efficient plan is to neutralize the target via an aerial strike, and that such a strike is lawful. The commander has a fully autonomous Reaper drone outfitted to undertake the mission. The drone is tasked with taking off, arriving at the target's location, confirming that the target is present, confirming that the target is not in the vicinity of so many non-combatants as to render the strike disproportionate, releasing its payload, then flying back to base. However, suppose that while en route to its target, the drone passes over a company of heavily armed enemy combatants who are isolated in the hills. Despite the fact that such a group is heavily armed, their offensive and defensive capacity against the Reaper drone is functionally irrelevant. In such a case, the hostile party is rendered hors de combat. Let us now imagine that the base commander, instead of sending the Reaper alone, decides to deploy a team of Navy SEALs to neutralize the target and that they are to travel using ground vehicles. In this case, high value target with SEALs, an autonomous Reaper drone is deployed to provide close air support for the SEALs but all other factors are the same as in high value target, with the SEAL team encountering the same heavily armed company of enemy troops. In this case, the Reaper should arguably not view the enemy combatants as being hors de combat, because those enemies can inflict casualties on the SEALs, and thus are not powerless and are therefore legitimate targets for the Reaper drone. Yet, in this case, the Reaper drone plus the SEALs forms an even greater asymmetric advantage over the enemy combatants. However, the factors that determine orders to combat status are not simply whether or not one is able to defend oneself, but rather whether or not one has the power to affect one's enemy. In this case, despite the advantage held by the SEALs and Reaper, the enemy troops are nonetheless able to inflict casualties, whereas in high value target, they are powerless against the Reaper and thus are arguably to be deemed 
orders to combat. These are some of the cases we employ to demonstrate the nature of the law regarding orders to combat. Autonomous weapon systems remain a hotly debated topic in both academia, but also in international public spheres. The debate over the ethics and legality of their design and deployment is further complicated by how actual military operations are currently carried out. How the letter of the law regarding military operations relates to and differs from the spirit of the law and how, as well, different autonomous weapon systems change how they legally relate to potential combatants. In an effort to clear up some of these complications, this paper draws on the legal articulation of orders de combat status, showing how this legal principle might impact on the design and use of autonomous weapon systems.